my table time to socialize and greet each other on the threshold of the holiday season. The, uh, we want to welcome you to this uh, meeting of the Northeast Coastal Coalition, which is focused <coughs> on a singular subject, which is the issue of flood insurance, which is an issue that has been growing in importance and concern um, over the last few years. And we've talked about it a lot informally at NECC and in other places, but we wanted to get together and, and talk about it in a more structured way. And it's important that we all understand what's happening and the fact that there are things that we can do to be able to try to address individual concerns and community-wide concerns. So before we get into the conversation, I want to uh, do what we always do here, and I see a few newcomers, so let's uh, go around the world and do introductions. Uh, I am uh, State Senator Bruce Carr, the Federal Chairman. Brendan? Brendan Zubricki, General Administrator. Peter Weber, I work with the Dan Chamber of Commerce. Andy Ford, Director of Planning Development, City of Newburyport. Barbara Dugan, Realtor with Evelyn Bulger Douglas Dean and Consulting. Uh, Karen Tibbet, Philosopher Water Mentor and, and a homeowner in a VE Lake Bill. Ellen Sibley, homeowner on the Mount Connection, Philosopher. I'm Ann Carolyn with the DCR Office of Water Resources. Joe Rossing, Massachusetts Coastal Coalition. Joey Dubois, the DCR Player Hazard Management Coalition. <clears throat> Brian Bell, the Water Director. Uh, Paul Francis, Chief of Police, Mass. Lisa O'Donnell, uh, Senator Joseph, and Richard Carter, former Governor. And Legend. <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so on. Alan McMillan, Rockport Conservation Commission. Laura Kozachek, Rockport Conservation Commission. Rick Rigoli, homeowner in Salisbury. Bill Sargent, New Report News. Brian Pike, Manchester Harbor Manager. Catherine Bain, Chief Drew Connor, Representative Brown Director. Senator Bruce, Mayor Beth Allison, Commission, Manchester Conservation Commission. Sasha Wan, Legislative Director of the Family Department. Therefore, I'm going to be swapping again. <laughs> 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 There's some people back there, too. Yeah. Mike Doherty, Office of Senator Carr. Okay, now I'm going to go. Uh, Gary Champion, uh, Proactive District Resident. So we have full representation this morning, uh, and why don't we, uh, we might as well go ahead and uh, ask our uh, television coverage to uh, be introduced. Uh, Ethan Cohen with the uh, Town of Newbury. All right, thank you, Ethan. So I would just stress one thing before we get into presentations is that the format that we use at NEPC and MRBA works for one reason and one reason only. We all sit at the table together. We have cooperation from non-governmental organizations, every level of government, you can see that here today, our academic institutions, and it always is a collaborative effort. And for those of you that are newcomers, you can see that once again today. This is the kind of configuration that helps us to get things done. And it's the reason that we've accomplished so many things like dredging projects and erosion prevention and, and other kinds of things. So, uh, enough about uh, the Coastal Coalition. Uh, we're going to start out um, with a presentation um, from um, our expert at DCR. And I do want to point out that um, we're very fortunate in Massachusetts that the Department of Conservation and Recreation has developed over an extensive period of time expertise in this issue. And uh, it's one of the reasons we wanted to have this meeting today is to let people know about that expertise and its availability. Um, at the community level and at the individual level. So um, Joy Deverall is here and she is incredible. And uh, we got a presentation from her at the State House a few weeks ago and we said you have to come to NECC. Um, so Joy is from uh, DCR and she is uh, the National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator in Massachusetts. Joy, the floor is yours. And would you like us to dim the lights or are they okay with it? So uh, thank you for asking me here this morning. This is really part of my, my regular job is to meet with uh, all kinds of groups at every 
level and to help them understand uh, flood risk and flood loss reduction and various things that you can do about that in Massachusetts. So um, what I'd like to do is just go quickly through a little bit of background and then give you some statistics on the insurance. Statistics are kind of boring, but maybe the numbers might inspire you to do something you didn't think about. And then um, talk just a briefly about mid flood mitigation. And then Joe is going to talk about some other things that have to do with flood insurance. Um, I can't remember everything that's in your presentation, Joe, but he's going to follow me with some other equally important information. So um, let's see. So uh, what I need folks to understand first and basically is that the, um, the National Flood Insurance Program is a federal flood insurance program that communities opt into voluntarily. So um, in Massachusetts, I think the very first community that did this was in the very early 1970s. I believe it was the town of Wareham. But um, what happened in the 70s and early 80s in Massachusetts was that people said, hey, I want to buy some of that federal flood insurance. And the only way they could buy it is if their community said, OK, well, then we'll do what FEMA wants us to do so that you can get that insurance. So you often hear comments about, well, FEMA's making us this and making us that. But what I'd like people to remember is it's a voluntary program. A community can join it at any time. They can also get out of it at any time, sometimes willingly, sometimes not. So um, in Massachusetts um, right now, the um, so let me back up again. In the Code of Federal Regulations, you can find the requirements to be a part of the National Flood Insurance Program. All of the requirements are there. Uh, and in Massachusetts, the requirements for development in the floodplain, most of those are found in our statewide building code and in the Wetlands Protection Act. There are a few other administrative things. We have a, a supplemental model, if you will, that helps communities capture those in their local bylaws or ordinances. So, oh, and I forgot about the septic. But um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything for you on this slide. Nope. So here are some of the statistics. We have 351 communities in Massachusetts. 10 did not ever opt to join the NFIP. Most of those are in the Berkshires at the top of the mountain. They figure if their floodplain is minimal, they'll take a chance. Uh, that's most of it. Um, as of last September, we had just over 60,000 policies in Massachusetts. That's less than 1% of all the policies in the nation. Um, there are over 5 million policies in the country. Um, the average annual premium in Massachusetts, $12.80 a year. Um, the insurance in Massachusetts, the federal flood insurance, covers more than $15.8 billion in property value. Remember, I'm going to keep saying the federal flood insurance because private flood insurance is also available. I don't have any of those statistics, and they're not included in this number. So um, in our coastal counties of Massachusetts, and I, that to me is any county that has a little piece of coast, um, there are uh, almost 50,000 policies. That's 82% of the total in the state. Um, the property, obviously, that's covered is over 13 billion. Um, and 1,405 properties on Massachusetts coast are in the B zone. That's the very high risk coastal high hazard zone. Um, on February 28th of 2019, there were 3,451 structures designated as repetitive loss structures. That simply means that they had, had or have an NFIP policy, and they've made claims on those policies at least twice to a certain value of the property. With the severe rep loss structures, it's at least twice to more than the value of the structure, or four times, four different times a claim was made for flood damages. So that's what that means. And here's a few numbers. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss them. Um, so for repetitive loss, and I, I'm, I'm just going to give you these quickly. Uh, if you've got a copy of the presentation back there, all these are on that. And certainly if you want to talk to me later, my card is back there, and the last slide gives you my contact information. I can forward you a copy of this. Um, but so there's the definition of rep loss. It's a FEMA term, repetitive loss. Uh, and again, it's defined by the interaction of their policies, how many times and how much they, they have claimed for. for so I, I apologize, I'm going to interrupt for just one second to make sure. If you need those documents, let's get them to you right okay. now. Okay, on the corner. I brought 30 copies, but I hope that's enough. I need them. <laughs>
don't get a copy, um, my phone and email will be on the last slide, and you can um, let me know that. And, and also, if you sign up, sign up, we will make sure to send everything to everybody as well. So. Yeah, and I'd like a copy of the same material. Thank you. Okay, I think we're just about resettled. Sorry about that. All right, no problem. Great, great to do that. Um, so just so you can see uh, the numbers for repetitive block structures, this was as of last February. Um, FEMA has kind of shut off that data to the states at this point uh, as they go through sort of a, a whole renewal of their database program and the lawyers got involved. And so now we can't get these numbers anymore. But as of last February, Situate had 554 repetitive block structures. So you can see where the numbers are. And these are all coastal, um, well, primarily coastal. I guess maybe Peabody might not be. Well, they do have low lying areas, but you can see how that goes. So if you're any one of those communities, if you're not any one of these communities, you have your community has less than 47 threat losses, if any at all. We do have plenty of communities that don't have any at all. Um, and so since 1978, when all of this recording began, um, the National Flood Insurance Program has paid out over 416 million for just over 34,000 claims in Massachusetts. Um, keep these numbers sort of in the back of your mind. We're going to talk about um, how underinsured we currently are in a minute. Um, so people always ask about the maps. I thought I would just throw this in quickly. Um, so for the maps, if you live in a coastal community, sometime over the past 10 years in Massachusetts, you probably got some updated FEMA maps. Um, how many of you are aware of whether you did or not in your community? Okay, so some of you are aware of it. Um, they did most of the coastal, FEMA had a, um, an agenda, their top priority was to get all the coastal communities of the country mapped by, I think it was like 2015, they didn't quite make that date, but I believe all the coastal communities in Massachusetts have been recently remapped within the last 10 years. Now they're working on the western part of the state. Um, so the maps in the coastal areas are typically as new as 2010, 2014, 2017 at the latest. Um, and the maps in Western Mass are like the 1970s. Very primitive methodology on those maps. So you're kind of blessed in the coastal area in that you have updated maps. Um, a community, if, if a, a property owner or a community uh, of any size doesn't like the map, they can hire engineers to refute the maps, um, either during the appeal period when the maps are being made or just as a letter of map revision process. So FEMA does have processes by which the maps, once they become effective, can be changed. Um, but the proponent who wants to change the map has to shell out the money for the engineering to prove that the FEMA maps um, are wrong. Um, and they are wrong um, more frequently than we'd like. So actually, let's go back one minute. So your maps um, in the eastern part of Massachusetts, um, this would be this would be a, um, a firmet, which is a snapshot of the official FEMA flood insurance rate map. That would be a sample of one. This would be a western mass. You can see how different they are. Um, can I ask you when a community um, disputes the FEMA flood map and they do pay to have some corrections made, does that then go up on the FEMA side or does it just stay within that community? How does, how does that stack up? So um, if FEMA approves, you have, to, you have to use their methodology and everything. And so if FEMA says, yes, what you have is correct and what we have is wrong, that's called a letter of map revision and the map actually is revised. So within typically two to three weeks, if you go online after you've received that approval uh, informal package from FEMA, you will see that the map has changed to the newly revised panels. Yeah. And that's why sometimes when you go on the FEMA Map Service Center, which um, I don't have their, um, uh, if you Google FEMA Map Service Center or FEMA Flood Maps, it will take you to that center. And you can see everything you want to know about the maps. You can see the revisions that were made. They keep those in a file. Um, and that's why sometimes when you see a community might have almost all their maps might be dated like 2014, and then there's a couple that are dated differently, probably because there were some revisions made on those panels. So, okay. So, uh, the big important thing about the FEMA maps is that Congress has not given FEMA the money to, and also the mandate, I guess, to make those maps 
forward looking. Everybody always asks about that. What we have to remember is the primary purpose of a max, the primary, not the only, but the primary purpose is flood insurance rating. So it's called a flood insurance rate map. FEMA's um, justification is that they cannot rate you and rate your policy based on what's going to happen in the future. That's what they said. That will all change. It's in the process of being changed. But right now, policies are rated on what has happened in the past. And the maps are created based on what has happened in the past. Um, so, oops, oops, oops. I went too far. So I guess what I want to say is, so FEMA has not yet incorporated things like sea level rise, increased precipitation, stormwater, urban flooding, nothing like that. Um, but if you do want information on um, Climate change, Massachusetts has a climate change clearinghouse that Governor Baker set up. Um, this is the address here, resilientma.org. And in that clearinghouse, you can find maps, data, documents, all about climate change, not just uh, about flooding, but extreme heat, um, frequency and intensity of storms, all kinds of climate change information that the, the state has accumulated. Um, you can find projections. Um, this is the Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management Sea Level Rise and Coastal Flooding Viewer you can find in there. And you can select an address. Um, I can't remember. I think this is Chelsea. Um, let, me, let me see if my notes tell me. No. Uh, but you can go in there and you can, uh, you can select an address and you can move a slider. So you can look at sea level rise, for example, from now all the way to 2100. And you can see the projections. Um, and those are, um, these are a range of projections. So if you want to be in the middle, you might pick this one, for example. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to get a feeling of what folks are saying about what's coming. And these are scientists, uh, the data is peer reviewed. It's not, it's nothing goofy on this website at all. Um, let me just make sure. I wanted to also say that, um, so FEMA, for folks that have the National Flood Insurance Program policies, um, 25 to 30 percent of the claims that are claimed through those policies are for folks that are not even in the FEMA flood zone. Okay, so so 30 percent of the flooding that FEMA is paying through those policies for is not even in the, the FEMA floodplain. I want to tell you that um, the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, that is the regional planning association for 101 communities in the Boston metro area. They did a study on the March 2010 storm that hit that area and caused a lot of flooding. I don't know if any of you remember that. Um, and they found that uh, when they looked at the FEMA flood policies and the individual assistance claims, because that was a federally declared disaster, so you could get a, an individual assistance claim, they found that 98% of the flood damages that were claimed in one way or another were outside the FEMA map flood capital. Areas. So, um, different things you could look at. It. I mean, the maps have been updated since then, so maybe the maps now include some of that. But nonetheless, I guess what I'm trying to share is that flood damages occur everywhere, uh, not just in the FEMA flood map area. If you do live in the FEMA flood map area and you have a mortgage on your property, you're required to have a policy, whereas if you're outside the map area, you're not required, but you may want to anyway. And here, could you repeat what was the, the percentage that you said? For the MAPC study, yeah. almost 93%. 93% mm -hmm. were not in the flood zone. Were not in the FEMA map flood. Obviously, they were in some kind of floodplain, but not the one FEMA map. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you want more information on getting to the source of that, just email me and I'll give you her contact information. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, because the FEMA maps don't have future projections, you know, you can pretty much take to the bank the idea that things are going to be worse than what they're currently shown at uh, in the near future. And just one more thing. Um, so increased tidal flooding leads to losses in home value appreciation. Uh, Hearst Street Foundation in Columbia University did a housing study recently, and they found that coastal homes in Massachusetts have collectively lost more than $273.4 million in relative appreciation, which is market value. Um, over the period of that study. And again, if that's something anybody would like details on, let me know and I'll get you the source for that too. Uh, but so just to say that it's going south and we want to try to change that and we can change it. Um, 
by flood mitigation and some other policies at the local level. I want to talk about how underinsured we are in Massachusetts. So I put together um, what I could find initially for this presentation, but then subsequently um, someone asked me for a little more research, so I'll share that today. But essentially, if you take the value of the building stock as it exists in 2017 in coastal Massachusetts, now um, I got these figures, the top figure, from the uh, 2018 State Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan uh, that is your state plan. And it shows that looking at general building stock in coastal mass um, in 2017, uh, that property was worth collectively about $45.7 um, million. So that's in coastal mass. Now, if you look at the National Flood Insurance Program policies coverage, it's only just over 13 billion. You can see the difference there. Um, 32 and a half billion dollars worth of something in coastal mass is not covered by a flood insurance policy, at least that we know of. Now, hopefully there are a lot of private flood insurance policies out there, and a lot more of this stuff is, um, is covered than we think. But if you're just looking at the federal flood insurance policy numbers, that's what you get. So, um, Another thing too, here's one, 70% of damages from Harvey were not insured. So the thing I wanna share with you that I looked at subsequently, someone asked, well that's coastal mass, what about the rest of Massachusetts? So the numbers that I could find, um, there's a difference, so we're not comparing apples to apples. That building stock was the estimated value of the building stock as it was, not replacement value. All I could find for inland mass was replacement value. So I'll just read you those numbers real quickly. Um, so, so if all of the non-coastal building stock in Massachusetts had to be replaced in 2017, it would have cost 135.2 billion to replace the non-coastal property. Um, the policies, uh, let's see, so there was, 4.3 billion in coverage, so the gap is um, almost 131 billion, a gap of coverage. And that again is at replacement. This is at not replacement. So you can see, what I guess my whole point is that we're very underinsured against flood damage in this state. Uh, and it's a fact that communities that are underinsured for damages, whether it's wind, flood, whatever it is, um, take much, 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 much longer to recover when a bad storm hits or something, a disaster takes place. So just to keep that in mind. Um, um, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Did yeah. you say, when you say coastal Massachusetts, is that designated by soil type? Or did you say? I'm sorry. No. So the um, $45.69 billion was coastal counties. counties. That's all. It was a geographic delineation based on jurisdiction. And then, so what I did was I minus those uh, to get the rest of the state. Yeah. Um, one other thing I want you to know, um, so the average payout, so in 2017, you remember we had a lot of, the nation had a lot of flood damages. It was Hurricane Harvey, Irma, uh, Maria. Uh, the average payout for a national flood insurance policy claim in 2017 was $120,000, okay? So if your property was damaged by flood, the average, property only got $120,000. The average payout, so those disasters were presidentially declared. If a disaster is presidentially declared, there can be other payouts like individual assistance for folks who didn't have an insurance policy. If you qualify for those, and these are considered to be grants, um, although some have to be paid back, but if you qualify for those under the presidential declaration, the average payout was like about $8,000. So you can imagine if you had flood damage to your home and you didn't have a flood policy, uh, like 70% of the damages from Harvey, you're not getting much money from the federal government to fix your property. Just wanted to point that out. All right. Oh, yes. Do you know how, uh, how many coastal homes are, are covered by private insurance? No, because uh, <clears throat> currently private insurers do not have to share that data with the federal government, which is how I would end up getting it. 
Um, however, uh, I believe, and Joe can probably talk to this, the insurance industry of this country has agreed that starting in 2021, they will share that data with, I'm not sure who, FEMA, Congress? It's still tentative. Okay. The, general, um, the general multiplier we put on private insurance is about 15% more than the, the NFIP premium. But that changes in Boston, for example. I know of a condo building that has a million dollar policy. Premium is paid for a million dollars and the NFIP's total premium in Boston is three million. So we know in metro areas that number is much greater. Yeah, and in some states, like Florida has a lot, of, they've been pushing private insurance for about a decade now. So they have a lot more compared to other states. So it just, it just depends. Yep. But it is a growing market, that's for sure, yes. I had a question about the significant loss, the repetitive loss. You started your presentation talking about that. What's the significance of repetitive loss? Is that is there a lot of repetitive loss structures or properties? Does that affect the whole region, the whole flood ranges in a region, or just those particular properties? It's kind of the opposite. So if you have a lot of flood risk, like Fitchwick, mm -hmm. then you have a lot of properties that are going to flood more often, more frequently than another community might. Does that make sense? And the definition of repetitive loss, that's a FEMA term. I mean, we can say, oh, geez, I've had repetitive loss because I don't have an NFIP policy. I don't have a FEMA repetitive loss property because I haven't claimed through their system enough. You see what I'm saying? So FEMA uses repetitive loss as a way to say this structure has had at least two claims and or the claims have been um, equal to at least 50% of the, of, the, of the property value, or they've had four claims within the last 10 years. Does yeah, that so, affect the premiums for that property? Oh, yes, oh, yeah. yes, yes. And, and does it affect yeah. the premium? So say you have one property with repetitive loss, and next door you have one without repetitive loss. Is so it does it affect them? So under the current rating, no. But FEMA is trying to switch. So FEMA's been rating properties the same way for 50 years. So if you're in the floodplain, if you're in an AE zone, let's say in your community, there's an AE zone right there. Every house in that AE zone is rated the same way. Whether one is right on the river or one is up the hill a little, it doesn't matter. They're all rated the same way. But FEMA is finally seeing the light and they have set into motion the engine, if you will, to begin to rate properties the same way your homeowner's property is rated. Your homeowner's property is rated by using global catastrophic modeling that's been in place for 15 or 20 years. Um, and so with global catastrophic modeling, you can pick a point on the earth and you can say right here on this point, these are all the perils that are right there. And these are the grades of those perils. So maybe you live in a community where there's a lot of theft your homeowner's policy is probably going to cost you a little more than a community that doesn't have so much debt. Or, you know, there's a lot more fire um, in your community. So the FEMA is going to start to rate that same way as soon as Congress lets them start doing it. Um, they were supposed to begin last year, um, but, um, or excuse me, they were supposed to begin this coming year, but, but Congress said, no, we don't like the look of this. Because what's going to happen is when they finally roll it out, the guy right on the river is suddenly going to find out that their risk is a lot more than the guy up the hill a little bit. Doesn't that make sense? But the guy on the river is not going to like what his policy is going to ultimately go to. But today, two properties, one with repetitive loss, one without, are their ratings the same? No, because the one that's repetitive loss has some additional surcharges because sure. they're repetitive okay. loss. Yeah, so they do sure. pay more. Now you've gone to the end of my knowledge of, um, of flood insurance, <laughs> as far as the details. Joe is the guy for that. So anyway, I think um, here, what I want to show is, this thing's driving me crazy, excuse me. Um, so what I want to show on this slide is the value of mitigation. So we can change these things. I mean, we don't all have to just move out from the flood risk area, although ideally that's the utopia. Nobody lives on the coast. We all just visit for vacations, go back, up the hill a little ways for the hotel, you know, and nobody has flood damages, but that's not real reality. So we can change our properties, we can make them stronger, we can fill in the basements that flood all the time, we can lift up the equipment that services our home, our boilers, our air conditioning units, we can strengthen um, 
the buildings in a number of ways you can strengthen our foundation. So I just wanted to show you this because FEMA recently came out with this and it shows basically that for um, riverine flood, um, the, if you put a dollar into mitigation, you're gonna save six down the line. And this is, these are big uh, broad brush um, uh, statistics because those dollars include things like um, there'll be less death and injury. There'll be less repair costs for structures. There will be less need for sheltering for displaced households, less loss of revenue and business interruption, less loss of greater um, economic activity in the community, uh, less loss of services like hospitals, fire stations, and other public um, services, uh, less other insurance costs outside of the claims, things that aren't covered, and less costs for search and rescue. So those dollars include all of that. Um, but you can see, you know, so basically, if you're looking at, um, you've got structures that are built according to the current code, for every dollar invested in mitigation, the community, the property owner, somebody in this broad brush saves 11, 11 bucks. And this happens over and over and over again. Uh, in another state that I worked in, we did lots of avoidance studies. And so every structure we mitigated, the next storm, the damages that didn't happen to that house were reported, but then the next storm, they still didn't have damages, and the next, and the next, and the next. So you see that it just gets bigger over time. Um, the lower uh, graphic is um, just a sort of a snapshot of uh, a structure. So these are um, numbers for a premium for a single family house, one floor, slab on grade, stonewall foundation, or crawl space with proper flood openings, who have 200,000 building coverage, 80,000 contents coverage with a $1,000 deductible, the same flood zone you can see an increase in how much higher above the base flood elevation they are, three feet above the base flood elevation. Their annual policy is much less than the one that's right sitting on the ground. So all of that, to your question too, matters. The structure itself matters. Um, the, the vulnerability of the structure. And let's see. Um, see, I think that's all. So that's me. Um, and that's just information that I have that maybe can help you make some different choices or think about different policies in your community moving forward. Certainly, give me a holler if you want to talk about any of that. Um, I talk to property owners, I talk to community officials, uh, other state and federal agencies on a regular basis, um, and I'm very happy to talk to any of you. Um, so, can we answer a few questions? Yes, absolutely. I think one of the things that's going to be of interest to a lot of folks is the idea that you might be able to challenge the map. And I know that some communities in our part of the state have. What I wanted to ask is, is I know this is an individualized uh, thing, but can you give us a ballpark estimate of what it costs to undertake such an effort, usually? Uh, so, not really, because it depends on what you're challenging. If you're just challenging the part of the map where a culvert goes under a road and you want to do something different there, you know, maybe your hydrologic and hydraulic study will cost you $50,000. I don't know, I'm not an engineer, I really don't know. Um, you could talk to some of the other communities that have done some community-wide loamers. I know the city of Beverly has done one. Um, has Marshfield done one? Yeah, I actually have some pricing if you want to Okay, so, yeah, you want yeah. to come up here and maybe Sure, so, so one of our board members on the coalition is a coastal engineer, and so we actually ask, ask this question fairly often, and we actually, even though we don't price out the work, I know that he does fairly often. Um, individual homeowners that would like to challenge the hydrology of a map, uh, it's about $30,000. Um, for a community to do it, again, it ranges, as Joy mentioned, but in Marshfield, where we did a community-wide loan mark, it was about $150,000 for the whole community. So, as Joy mentioned, the prices will vary, but that gives you some ballparks. That is really helpful. It is. And, and so, for Brendan, Essex is $25,000 for the whole community. For the coastal camera. Sure. For the whole community, twenty-five. dollars So, probably what you were challenging wasn't, exactly. uh, didn't require yeah. as stiff a, a set of data as it someone else. It was more of a general look at the methodology, and they were able to show that the methodology for our area that, that they would, the federal government, Yeah, and our in the communities that I pro I gave you the price for hired multiple consultants, challenged multiple communities at the same time, and so that's most likely why the price was so vastly different. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, and one note. If you are a property owner and your structure is shown on the FEMA map as in the floodplain, but you go and pay a surveyor a thousand bucks or whatever to survey your property because you think that you're on like a little bubble of land, so you're actually a little higher, and you think that your base flood elevation where you are is higher than what's on the map, then you can, you can personally, for that parcel, challenge, if you will, FEMA by submitting a letter of map amendment. All that costs you is the elevation certificate. Um, and if it turns out that you can be, quote unquote, removed from the floodplain, even though you're actually captured in it, but if you're, if you're just high enough, uh, then you would not be required to buy the flood insurance. Quick story on that, too. The comp station right back here that you need to have public restrooms in it, that was that actually in a floodplain, but it was built such that it was new that we were able to have it carved out of the of the uh, Yeah. So just that spot and that's called letter of map amendment. And again, you can Google any of these things and get more information or let me know. Just a warning to everyone, if you're gonna try to attempt this, you must have a permit before you pour it tonight. So if everybody <laughs> tries it tonight, we're gonna be watching you very carefully. <laughs> so just a point of um, uh, clarification. Uh, so anyone can file, it doesn't have to be a government entity, it can be an individual? It well, an individual would be filing only for their own structure, yeah. their own parcel. Okay. Yeah, and uh, like a commercial property owner could use a letter of map amendment okay. process. I don't think, do we not? For a commercial owner? Yeah. Yes, but it depends on what you're challenging. So yeah. to Joey's point, if you're challenging the structure's elevation, anyone can do that, commercial, residential, town, whatever. If you're challenging hydrology, meaning changing the actual map, yeah. anyone can also do that. But again, if you're challenging your own individual location, you would be charged quite a bit more, fifteen to thirty thousand, and that actually may impact adjacent properties, but very small impacts. Yeah. So, uh, so a homeowner could just pay for an elevation certificate, or they may already have it, and they can file online the letter of amendment, yeah. no charge. Yeah, once you go to revising the map, there's automatically a FEMA fee, and exactly. you've got to have hydrology. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I see a bunch of questions. Ellen, do you want to get started? Sure. Um, I just I have a, a quick comment and then a question. And the comment is my takeaway, thank you for it, for a very informative uh, presentation. And my takeaway is that FEMA would really like to encourage communities uh, to do the fiscally responsible thing, which is to apply for mitigation grants so that um, properties can be taken out of harm's way. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and my question is, one of the parts of raising a house, for example, is egress. That's a big part of it. And so um, I have a, a very close neighbor. So the way that I encourage water to flow, right now my house becomes kind of an island, a little island of mm -hmm. myself when we have a storm surge or a high, high water flow from tide that bumps me close to right on Gloucester Harbor or the extension. But um, if the mitigation involves changing the flow of water, it's going to impact my neighbor. Because I don't want to dump water into their yard, and I don't want them to to do some mitigation and dump water into mine. Right. So my question is, does the Army Corps of Engineers get involved in any way? I've heard somewhere along the line that they will act as a sort of consultant to you about this you water don't know, flow. You don't need to go to federal partners for that. So coastal zone management, Massachusetts has a fabulous coastal zone management team, um, and they are all over that. Number one, the um, 310 CMR um, Wetlands Protection Act and other parts of the 310 CMR regulations, they also regulate exactly what you're talking about. So if you're in a coastal dune, or even if you're not in a coastal dune, if you're in some other coastal area where someone wants to do something that will increase flooding to those around them, they're not supposed to be able to be allowed to do that. And so DEP gets involved in that too, our DEP. Because you, you want to do something that would avoid that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you look at the Wetlands Protection Act and all of the things in there to um, start your case. And, and very well represented here by Captain Gordon. Oh, Long yeah, I didn't even see you and there. So yeah. that's something you want to get to know. Yeah, but I didn't even see the cherry blossoms. So. Oh, great. So I'll probably just see you. Yeah. Hi, I didn't even see you there, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Other questions, Bill? What would you expect the next round of maps generally for um, the ballpark next round of maps that we might see? And do you think that they might include future projections? 
So Congress um, <clears throat> told FEMA that they do want to include future projections at some point. The problem is money. Um, Congress has allocated for the last few years 400 million per year for FEMA for mapping. Um, we just talked about the costs of doing hydrology work. So you can see that 400 million a year isn't gonna get you much for the whole country. So what FEMA did was they went through in the, um, in the, over the last 20 years, they went through all the coastal areas of the country. Now what they're doing is they're changing from city and, and county maps to watershed maps. So now they're looking at things at the watershed level. I believe Hub 8, I'm not sure, you might know differently. But, um, so they are looking at the watershed, they're going to the older areas that either don't have maps or have old maps. So right now, for example, FEMA Region 1 in Massachusetts is updating the old western and central mass maps. Um, they're not even really doing a lot of studies though because they don't have the money. So they're just doing a little bit of studies on this stream reach or that, wherever there seems to be increased development. Um, they're doing studies on that and basically just cleaning off the maps, applying the new the new LIDAR that we have instead of the old topo that they had, which was really horrible. And so the maps are gonna be better, um, but they still need a lot of studies. So for all practical purposes, we're a ways out from some of the projected uh, situations working with ways of the maps that would be... Um, yeah, I mean, unless you have representatives that, you know, you push something, I mean, and the, the, other, the other argument is you have to remember that the maps are for insurance. So they would have to overcome that, and Joe, maybe can talk about, they'd have to overcome that insurance situation where they're right. charging you for future. But your homeowners does already, so. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Right, I think I'm going to let Joe talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. two hats. Um, not only am I the chairman and executive director of the Massachusetts Coastal Coalition, uh, I am also uh, the head of all flood operations for Rogers Gray Insurance. We're one of the large, nation's largest independent insurance agencies. So as Joy mentioned, I see a lot of different things across the entire country. Um, I have uh, for you today a state of the marketplace for flood insurance. We just had meetings and calls with London recently about private flood insurance, where things are going. I know that's a big interest for a lot of people, um, but we're also going to focus on challenges that our communities face when it comes to flooding and what solutions we actually have to some of those challenges. But before I begin, I figured I would quiz everybody here very quickly. You know, Joy, made a very good point of adding up and accumulating our replacement cost of structures in and out of the high-risk flood zone. But if you were to add up all of the structures in Massachusetts and the amount of flood insurance across all structures in the state, does anybody have a ballpark about what the percentage of insurable, the uh, percentage of insurance on those structures are for flood? All zones, <coughs> all the state. We have 20, Joy is 25% in high and low risk flood zones. 25? 5. 5%. Anyone else? All right. 10. 1%. So we have a problem. I think Joy alluded to it. We have a very big problem here, not just in Massachusetts. Does anybody know what the national number is? If you add up all structures and all flood policies, it's 12%. So we have a huge under insurance, under insurance and non insured problem. So here's me. This is a little bit about my background, just so you have a little bit of context of where I'm speaking from today. And across all the different pieces that I'm involved in, I think the most important thing is to know why people call me Joe Flood. That's because I touch a lot of different areas all across the country and locally when it comes to flood-related hazards. And that is actually the mission of the Coastal Coalition. But before we go into that today, we're gonna to be speaking a little bit about what's going on nationally. We have a legislative update, big legislative news as of yesterday we'll talk about. 
Then we'll talk about Joy's, <coughs> what Joy mentioned earlier about that new program that's happening, Risk Rating 2.0, and it's delay now. That just happened last week. Mitigation and insurance in our communities and local legislation that has been proposed by the Coast Coalition and others that we're trying to push to move further uh, along. So a little bit about who we are. There's a lot of stuff up here, but I think the biggest thing to take away from this slide is our mission. It is to educate, advocate, and inform on all flood hazards. So if you are a community official, stakeholder, insurer, realtor, lender, anyone, that's who we're touching and to get our information out there about what's going on in the world of all flood hazards. So uh, I know I've had some people come up to me today and ask if we come to local community groups, offices, yes we do, we'd be more than happy to do that for anyone in any organization. Some of the stuff we've worked on you can show here, we're actually going to talk about some of that through today's presentation. So let's take a look at the national perspective. As of today, the National Flood Insurance Program was extended yesterday to December 20th. So for some context, the National Flood Insurance Program was established in 1968 under the National Flood Insurance Act, August 1st of 1968. So we're 51 years into the flood program. Uh, and every so often, Congress has to extend or reauthorize the program. Anybody remember the last big reauthorization? It was bigger waters in 2012, and it had been amended in 2014, but it expired in September of 2017. So this is our 12th short-term extension. Congress really cannot figure out how we're gonna move the flood program further along in the future. The House and Senate have both introduced conflicting bills, and with two conflicting bills, there is no clear path forward as of right now. So here are some of the current pieces of legislation that sit within this Congress. They vary from having five-year reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program to capping flood insurance profits to 22%, they're currently 30.9. Um, repeal of some of the surcharges, the Senate bill does not include any private flood insurance acts, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And this is why we have a stalemate. This is the second time since 2017 we've had a stalemate in legislation. Risk Rating 2.0. So Risk Rating 2.0 is the new rating program that Joy had been talking about during her presentation. It is a total redesign of how we rate structures. And Joy had mentioned how that happens now. So it delivers rates that are fair, clear, and meet current industry standards. So as Joy mentioned, current industry standards, if you get a homeowner's policy, is not the current standards that's used to rate a flood insurance policy. They're no longer binary. Joy mentioned in an A zone, whether you're near the ocean or near a little bit of a hill within that A zone, for the most part, the structures are rated very similarly. Once risk rating 2.0 happens, that would become graduated. Somebody near that river is paying more than somebody away from that river, for example. Replacement costs, commercial catastrophe models, and easily collected data all then go into how a structure is rated. This has been delayed to 2021 after immense pressure from Congress. So you'll see here I have examples that are a little hard to read. But what the point being is that the structure on the right is closer to the river in the same zone as the structure on the left, and you'll see the current premiums and how they differ once risk rating 2.0 is implemented. So let's talk about our local perspective now, mitigation and insurance in our local communities, right? So here's the issue. We have flood maps that have changed and increased our flood elevations. We have nor'easters that have significantly impacted our coastline, and we have storm damage that is being received more frequently from multiple reasons in the communities that we all live in. And everybody's asking, how can we fix this? How can we help rates? How can we make things more cost-effective and resilient in our communities around flood-related hazards? So this chart, there had been some questions about rates this chart tells you what those rates look like. So, how do I make myself and my community more resilient? What financial resources are available to recover? And why is my flood insurance increasing or so expensive? 
So the top chart is NFIP, and the bottom chart is private flood insurance. And the first thing you'll notice is that for the same structures, those rates are really good. Now, the challenge we run into with private flood insurance is several. The National Flood Insurance Program writes all structures except for about five categories of structures. Private flood insurance, because they're making a profit, gets to pick and choose. There's one National Flood Insurance Program. There's 140 roughly private flood insurance programs. These numbers are just from one of those programs. So one program may write a structure, and another might not. One program might write a structure for the price you see, and the other might be twice as high. The other problem we run into is there's a very confusing regulatory environment around private flood. States do not oversee most private flood companies because they're not admitted or a crossover in Lloyd's of London across the ocean. And the lenders are not always accepting private flood policies, even though federal regulators told them how to do it this year. So we have a kind of a confusing world. It's what I call the wild west of private flood. And because of that, there's a lot of liability on agents that provide you the policies and a lot of diligence that you'll have to do as a consumer to understand that policy and what coverage you're getting. The big thing I've heard recently about private flood is, Oh, I got a private flood policy. I have much better coverage at a cheaper price than the National Flood Insurance Program. I probably have reviewed 50 different private flood options in the marketplace and can tell you that that is not always the case. You have to do your, diligent, your due diligence. But the point of this slide really is to show you that for those that are, and Joy had mentioned repetitive losses, two losses of $1,000 or more in a 10 year period, Severe repetitive losses are the only place you'll see a premium implication. Those are four losses of $5,000 or more, two within a 10 year period, or two losses twice the value of the structure. All that means is you've had a lot of flood losses. Those premiums in a VE zone are upwards of almost $17,000 right now. And if you notice my chart at the bottom, private flood doesn't want to touch them. These are the structures we're seeing the most significant premium implications for right now in our community. So this tells me and tells us a story that the mitigation that we're going to be talking about today really should be focused around those areas that see the most significant flooding. Because those are the areas where the premium, where the price, the cost, the financial resiliency becomes an issue in our communities. So I have a couple examples for you. These are two examples of how both NFIP flood insurance and private flood insurance solve critical financial concerns. This case right here is actually a severe repetitive loss. In a local community, he was grandfathered in the wrong zone. So he was paying about $4,500, $4,600 a year but when he became a severe repetitive loss, he filed that one last claim that kicked him into the SRL program. He then was going to be paying $26,000 because he was grandfathered wrong to begin with. We got old elevation certificate. This is one of the oldest ones I've ever seen. It's not hard to read. That's not the point. It's just meant to show you that it was old, but young. He, barely, he found it. It was in a bunch of stuff. So, he showed it to his current agent. The agent said, I'm not really sure this is going to help. You're severe repetitive loss. You have a basement. You're right on the seawall. There's not much we can do. Well, when we took that elevation certificate, he was only four feet below the flood elevation, and his premium went to 12000 After he cut some premium off of his policy to make it more affordable, he's paying 5600 in flood insurance. So we solved that problem by simply looking at additional data that was available. Yes, we have a question. But doesn't that uh, sort of go against common sense? Because what you're saying, you're looking at it financially, but it may be that some of those areas you shouldn't are, are you should be worried about, and you should be concentrating on the areas where you can have more impact, where you can create more resiliency. Correct. You're very. You're, that's a very good point. We're actually going to talk about how those issues are addressed in a couple slides. But that's a very good point. You're absolutely right. But I think the point really is, is that you know, in a lot of cases, when we're looking at our communities, and I have a whole separate presentation about financial resiliency in our local communities, 
a lot of the times that people like this don't want to be there, but they have no choice because they're in a home that's having significant losses and they have no financial way of getting out of that because who wants to buy a home with significant losses? What we're doing here in this case is simply helping them at least sustain their, their home at the current time financially, and then eventually, and we'll talk about mitigation grants next, that now can come in and hopefully help them buy that property out or elevate that home. So that is a very good point, though. But in this case here, we actually looked at private flood as an option. So in this case, it was a yacht club on Cape Cod. It was rated in an A zone, but was always in a B zone. If you notice something common about these issues, there seems to constantly be some type of current data issue, B zone versus A zone, a zoning issue or something, an elevation certificate that can't be found. These little things make a big difference when we're looking at not just the rating of a structure, but the community's information about where those losses are taking place. So rate with a basement building actually had a walkout if we had moved the building and kept it within the NFIP, the premium would have been 70 grand. The lender involved, so there were some penalties, but obviously it outweighed the penalties by moving it to private flood. They wrote it for 13,000. So again, private flood can in some cases solve some of the financial pains our communities are experiencing. Now, going from financial pains of the individual to financial pains of the community, financial concerns. I got a really interesting study this year when I was speaking at the National the Association of State Flood Plain Managers Conference about financial resiliency in Cleveland. And I found this statistic very interesting. If you took all the presidentially declared disasters since 1953, and this is done by county, that's why there's so many, there's 39,000, and these are only the ones declared for flood. 54%, Joy talked about individual assistance, how that will pay about 8,000 on average, and I think it did during Harvey you mentioned. In 54% of those declared disasters, individual assistance wasn't even included in the declaration. So more often than not, that financial assistance that's there for those that have nothing after a storm isn't even available. This only adds to the concerns that Joy had expressed earlier about the underinsured or non-insured issue that we so here are some solutions that the COSA Coalition has tried to implement that also goes to some of the issues that your communities are most likely facing. Yes, Art's head is cut off for, for, on, for a reason. Um, we're just showing you an example of what our website has. We actually have a flood insurance service center where your questions about flood insurance can be answered right on our website. We've had a staff person that's been hired to answer those flood insurance questions. And that was because we were getting so many of them and realized there was no good repository to get those questions answered. Additionally, community rating system, another tool for community resiliency. And I really like the way Joy over the years has presented CRS. So for those that are not familiar with CRS, community rating system, it's a program within the National Flood Insurance Program that if a community does certain things, it will reduce the flood premiums for everybody in that community. But the way that Joy puts it, it actually also, and this is, which is true, will primarily make the community more resilient. And I can have a few examples here. So the implementation, what we've done is we've done a full implementation of CRS on the community of Marshfield, Mass. It kind of let me take their community on as a test kitchen. And when we did it properly, and we implemented all the different things that we were doing in the town, we elevated their rating from a nine to a seven, which is a two class jump. Not only did it give everybody in the community a 15% discount on their flood insurance, we're one of only four communities in all of New England and New York to include what's called a plan for public information. And that plan coordinates all the outreach activities of a community. And I personally think this is an incredibly powerful tool for, for the community of Marshfield and for others that do plan for public information. Because as I addressed earlier, the public, the personal issues that an individual homeowner faces are going to be a community's biggest concern sometimes. Also, in 2019, we, are starting, uh, we had a CRS symposium right up here in Lynn on the North Shore. Some communities may have been there. Uh, we, we are starting in the spring two CRS user groups. 
B, that if there are communities in here interested in joining CRS, make sure you take our information and get signed up with us to be no notified when those groups will be starting. Joy will actually be doing some of the training there for those groups and starting in the spring. Uh, and a focus of our CRS program in Marshfield, as I mentioned, was flood insurance purchase studies, public outreach, and, a community, and community resiliency overall. CRS is a great and underutilized tool, in my opinion, to help communities with resilience. And our health program. Now, we're currently looking for pilot communities for this program. Um, the health program stands for Hazard Elimination and Loss Prevention. It is a joint venture between the COSA Coalition and two other entities to actually do a full implementation of the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program in communities across the state, potentially the country, after we pilot it in two communities. Um, the idea would be that there are, are, the health program has philanthropic funds which would actually pay for the upfront cost to get into some of these grants, and the joint venture has enough staff and knowledge to not only help the individuals apply for those grants, but then implement them on the back end after the community is awarded the grant. So the health program is something we're currently working on. If your community is interested or you know of those interested, please let us know because we've got the tools and uh, people in place to start to make this happen. What's really interesting about the Federal Mitigation Assistance and the HMGP is FMA is for severe repetitive losses and repetitive losses primarily, and HMGP is available only after a president presidentially declared disaster, but is another great tool to help mitigate your community's resiliency concerns. Elevating homes, acquiring homes, or other properties, um, really great tools that are underutilized, again, in my opinion. Okay, let's talk about the two pieces of local legislation that we have proposed in the past and are looking to gain momentum back on here at the local level. So the first is the special commission. This was proposed in the environmental bond bill, actually made it through to the governor's desk and then never was passed by the legislator, but there's some momentum we think to get this back moving. The commission was established um, if the bill, the legislation, would establish a commission to investigate and scope a state grant or low interest loan program for structural elevation or acquisitions. What I really find interesting and that is not spoken enough about is that at least for the FMA program, those grants are actually reimbursement programs. And so just because you're given a grant doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to afford that grant and the reimbursements associated with it. Now, local banks and lenders in communities dealing with grants can find and have found alternative funding solutions, but a program like this would be a perfect opportunity to low interest loan to these types of uh, grants or those looking just to do mitigation. You know, I think Joy mentioned earlier that the average claim in Harvey was 106 or 120,000, and but the average loss payout over the history of the program is only about 40,000. And a lot of those losses happen because you've got a heating utility in the basement or you don't have flood vents installed in an enclosure properly. So mitigation and those small activities make a big difference. Um, it would greatly help our layered defense, right? Our seawalls, our beaches, there's two of them, but the third part of our layered defense is our structures in their mitigation. Um, and federal legislation, which is proposed, actually allows for states to borrow low interest loans for states, and this program would fit right into that with federal legislation. Sure. Yes. And just uh, give you a brief update on that. So after yes. your presentation at the Post of Apocalypse, yes. um, the House Chair, which is Josh Cutler, and I are reworking a version of this. And awesome. And we want to make sure, because we know that it needed some changes, some modifications, sure. to make sure that we but in the new year, uh, the postal pocket will be filing um, in person awesome. with that bill. And we're going to need your help. Um, as I know we will get it, um, but we're going to need your help to lobby that. So we'll have a version on the table in the new year. That's awesome. And this is the type of partnership that has been so valuable uh, to make these types of things happen because obviously, Senator, you realize the importance, and so we appreciate that greatly. So thank you. And there's our structure, there's our seawall, and there's our beach as our layer of defense. 
and then the zone determination legislation. Um, this was, uh, <laughs> for the last four years, I've sat on the National Flood Determination Association Board of Directors, and as an advocate for the zone determination industry, I also have seen the pitfalls over the years. Uh, you, you saw in both examples I gave that there was a zoning issue involved with those structures, and that is because there is no federal regulation around zone determinations. A bank will determine your zone, but they use a third party vendor that has no federal regulation about how they do those zone determinations. And so it's been in the last two years, states have actually found ways to help fix that. We had proposed legislation around zone determinations being done uh, by those that are actually certified in some type of engineering or land surveying uh, field. And so that is one place where we're looking to hopefully push legislation that will be more of a consumer protection against known determinations that are done right, which is unfortunately about 20% of the time. And so this is my contact information. Um, we uh, also have, through the Coastal Coalition, a free membership program. There's some info on the back, and by being a member, you get all the benefits of the Coastal Coalition downloads, information like you have in front of you today. Uh, and again, reach out to us for any flood information, uh, flood hazard information that you might need. And uh, as Joy did, I will be more than happy to answer questions. <coughs> yes? The, is flood? flood and erosion, erosion. In other words, when the sea gets rough and erodes the house away, is that flood insurance or is that erosion? Yes, so that is flood insurance. So flood insurance covers sudden erosion. It will not cover gradual erosion. So if you have a home on the ocean and over the last 10 years your beach has disappeared and then one storm it just falls in, that's not covered. If you have a home like you saw in the Cape during the 2018 storms where you had a beach, the waves come in and wash the home and the beach right out from under it, that's a covered loss. So a person that owns a house and the beach retreats slowly and then eventually the big storm comes in March and takes the house down, they have no insurance? Potentially they have no coverage for that loss. But if they have beach in front of them, and the storm, the reason for the collapse is due to the erosion of the land underneath it, under that particular storm, they would have coverage. How does, how it's, does not black, it's not black and white. It's very rarely black and white. So a sudden erosion, meaning the storm comes in and grabs the house and pulls it out because of the erosion of the land, is a covered loss. If the storm comes and the house falls in, but it's not due to erosion of land from that particular storm, then there would be no coverage. So it's not- But, but if you've lost your beach, which is natural on a, a sand, sand island, mm -hmm. you lose your beach, your beach comes back, goes away, mm -hmm. and you have three major storms, and all of a sudden the houses stop popping in the water, all right? Which happens. It does. They are not, or they are. Well, in theory, they would have coverage under the storm that it happens under if the cause of loss is the land underneath being pulled out due to that storm. Because we've had situations where the building sits on the seawall, for example, and there's been a gradual loss of beach in front of the building, and the building will fall in due to the pilings breaking, due to the walls collapsing, due to a structural error and the erosion of the beach caused the water eventually to get closer to the building, but didn't necessarily cause it to collapse, and that is not covered under the National Flood Insurance Program. So, so it's, now it's, a, it's a planning issue. I mean, basically the assumption is the homeowner has some idea that there's erosion happening over time, and that there's a, a need to maybe plan ahead for that, whereas if it suddenly happens catastrophically, that's a surprise. No, what, he, what he's saying is, is if you have a home and it's sitting on uh, see the post, okay, which they build houses on beaches for years on see the post, mm -hmm. and it fell over, it wasn't properly reset up on good posts that go deep into the ground. That's what you're saying, right? That's a, a basically, yeah, because we see this a lot on Nantucket where homes have to be moved back because of the gradual erosion of the right. beach there, and that type of loss is not covered. So in other words, the see the post house, it gets wrecked, 
you're saying you're not insuring it even though you have insurance on it. Well, again, that's a gray area that the adjuster, the loss, the adjuster that goes out there has to make a call on that. If you read the policy, it says gradual erosion is not covered, sudden erosion is. And how that's interpreted when there's a loss is up to the adjuster who intend who goes to that loss. Because so, the whole idea is to put a house on poles that at least go 20 feet in the ground mm -hmm. so that when the erosion comes, the house is still there active. <laughs> There's also a whole section in the flood policy that says that uh, those types of construction that, that construction not done properly is not going to be a cause of loss. It has to be the flood itself. So I want to just jump in and encourage great caution here to not paint with broad brush strokes because this is a highly individualized situation. And I get the concept wrong that you're trying to emphasize, but I also just want to remind people that when you're getting into this venture, you really need to understand the individualities of the policy mm -hmm. and the situation on the ground because I, I wouldn't want anyone to draw any conclusions, any broad conclusions from the conversation. I think that, Ron, you emphasized the point, which is very good, which is make sure to understand what is covered and what is not right. so you don't find yourself in a real problem down the line. Okay, we, next. Yep, good. So along those lines, is there some resource for consumers to periodically review their policies with maybe not their companies, I guess this is certainly the case, they're reviewing their policies with their companies and they're afraid the companies are gonna come in and say, okay, Chase, because of this situation that's happening, we may either increase your premiums or give you coverage, but we're not gonna cover you. Is there some other independent way for consumers to analyze the policy and insurance? I think well, we'll again, that's, that's a really great topic, that's a really great question. So so let me tell, let me, let me tell you what I've seen in the field, because I've done a lot of work with address, adjusting companies. And when in the insurance industry, when we write a policy, the rubber meets the road when there's a loss. And so if something wasn't done right when we wrote the policy or something wasn't conveyed right when we did something originally at the time we wrote it, zone issues included, then there is going to be a problem when there's a loss. How big that problem is, again, that's really hard to determine because a lot of the times, even if the policy may have coverage for something, how it was written from day one by the agent could have a lot of implications about how that policy will pay out. So, you know, the first thing I would suggest people do is to read, actually read, if they're getting a flood insurance policy, well, actually, whether you're in or out of the National Flood Insurance Program, read the policy, and I'll give you a perfect example why. Because the National Flood, and I'll give you a perfect example. So, when we run the National Flood Insurance part of Program policy, debris removal, the removal of debris that comes onto your property from, say, a deck from a house up near the ocean and it comes down and hits your property, that is covered up to the limit of the building. So, 250000 is the most you can write for the flood policy through the National Flood Insurance Program. They have up to 250000 that they can use to remove that debris. We have recently seen a flood policy claiming to be the same as the National Flood Insurance Policy that limits debris removal to 25% or $10,000, whichever is less, which in some cases is a huge issue because sometimes your debris removal is 50% of your claim. So in those are the instances where we really encourage people to look at their flood insurance policies and well, what we're seeing is when you go to your point, when you go and ask the company, well, is this the same as the NFIP? The answer is, oh, of course it is, when really in the details it isn't. So we've worked both at the coalition and through some other companies I've been involved with, we've worked really hard to try to figure out the best way of determining whether a policy is what we call as broad as the NFIP, because the NFIP sets the standard. And I will note that as bad as a reputation as the NFIP gets, for claims, they're actually very, very liberal on what they will pay out. So it's really the gold standard when it comes to all other flood insurance policies and how they're administered. So there is one, there is one program I know of that is approving policies on behalf of lenders, but the lending rules say the policy has to have at least the same coverage as the NFIP or more. And that program is approving them for lenders and giving those types of comparisons. So that is one independent source that is not comparing them for consumer protection, but comparing them for lender acceptance. And that is pretty much the closest I can give you for having a policy that's independently checked. 
Because lenders can't accept anything that's less than the NFIP. Yes, Joel. Oh, thank you, that's great. So one of the things I mentioned earlier in the legislative section was that there hasn't been the passing of any type of private flood insurance legislation at the federal level. What I mean by that is, is that if you're in the National Flood Insurance Program and you leave for a private flood policy, there are penalties to come back to the National Flood Insurance Program. Now, some people like the, like the, con, like the Yacht Club in, on the Cape, they found it to be way worth you know, the penalties to go to the private flood market. They said, you know what, if we ever, ever have to come back, we're not gonna pay 70 grand today just because we may have to come back in 10 years or so. We're gonna pay you know, the 13,000 versus 70 was a financial decision that they made. But know when you're talking to people in your community that there are penalties if you leave the National Flood Insurance Program and then later have to come back. Now, one thing I will add is private flood right now, and I told you I'd give you a state of the market, it's a difficult market. London is non-renewing. There are, they've had tough claims. We know one slip, meaning one company, that has had a 300% loss <laughs> ratio over the last three years. Flood, uh, homeowners insurance companies, if you remember 2015 and all the chaos that went on with the ice dams uh, after that winter, they had 110% losses. So you're talking about three times as many, and it's just a difficult market. So know that if we're, at least at, at Rogers Gray, when I'm writing a private policy, if we're apples to apples with the NFIP and we're within $200 or so, we're sticking with the National Flood Insurance Program. Not to say private flood is bad, it's just a difficult market right now. So thank you, Joy, for mentioning that. Yes. I hear a number of things here and I'm really troubled. Um, Laura and I live in a coastal community. We're involved in coastal storm damage winters all the time. Insurance companies, for everyone's benefit, are in the business of making money. We are facing global earth warming, ocean level rise. We're talking about all kinds of innovative ways to have an insurance company give you money when your house is damaged. We're not talking about what to do to prevent this, moving houses away from the coast. Right now in the town of Rockport, we have a failing seawall, which the state of Massachusetts built in the 1930s, and we didn't build it. You know, it is failing. The cost estimate to replace that bridge, that uh, seawall, 4,000 foot long seawall, with the payment over a 20 year period is $50 million. It's the little town of Rockwood. You ain't no way they're going to have it. The cry nationwide, <coughs> whether it's state legislature or national Congress, is cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes. Where is the great pie in the sky that the money is going to come from to build in resiliency, move houses away from the ocean, and enable you to make a profit? It's simply not there. This is a lot of fancy talk. I'm really grateful for this program, for Senator Todd's work. But the bottom line is the money isn't there. The population is increasing. The ocean level is rising. The damage is becoming. We're having 100 year storms every 20, 30 years now. So I, I appreciate what you're saying. But we're, we haven't advanced any place until we can do something realistically about stopping the damage. You, there is no private insurance company that's going to insure homes on the ocean today because they're losing, as you pointed out, 100 to 300 percent over a short period of time. You're bleeding cash in these private companies. So that leaves, since the law says private homeowners have to have insurance, that means Joe Smith Farmer in North Dakota is helping pay for a rich guy's house on the coast of New Jersey. We can't go on like this forever. It's unfair to everyone. We continue business as usual. Where have we heard today realistic programs to mitigate and prevent this from happening. So I'll give you just a couple responses to that because that's a great point. The first is the hazard mitigation assistance, the HMA programs that FEMA gives, that FEMA provides. Um, they provide FMA for home elevations acquisitions and HMGP. But one of the things that they're also offering starting next year is called the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities program. And that is a nationally 
available program for projects that will reduce risk in communities by doing things such as mitigating, whether it be mitigating seawalls or mitigating or large buyouts or whatever it might be, to mitigate those types of long-term costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where's the money coming from? Well, also this past year, there was funding that was passed in, the, in Congress and signed by the President to allow for 12%. Is that the right number? I think it's 12% for brick? It's 6%. 6% of all disaster appropriations nationwide are put aside each year into the BRIC, into a mitigation fund, and it'll most likely be used for BRIC programs. In bad years, where we have a lot of disaster declarations, it's estimated that number will be somewhat as high as $2 billion a year to go to these large, not necessarily infrastructure, but large community resiliency projects. So there's also pending legislation, as I mentioned, it's pending you know, for a while now, but there's pending legislation that would allow for an additional two billion, I think it's two or four billion dollars to be put into that same fund. So at the end of the day, you're right, it's been difficult to move the needle forward on true resiliency community-wide. I mentioned the CRS program, that's not a funding mechanism, it's more of an awareness and resiliency amongst what communities can do with their current operating uh, operations. But things like brick are coming down the line. And there's also been recent discussion around the community, I'm gonna get the CBDG funding for disaster uh, declaration. I forget what the last part of that is. DR, thank you. DR funding, which would take more money from, and I forget where the money would be appropriated from, I think, the, I think it's just a general appropriations, would go into CBDG for grants to do very similar things as the BRIC program is planning to do. So, there are some very recent uh, steps that have been taken on the federal level to address some of these long-term issues. Joe, I'm actually going to jump in here as well. And Alan, okay. I, to say, I really appreciate your comments. I just want to remind everybody that this is one meeting of the NACC. We meet fairly regularly to talk about a lot of the subjects that you're describing. Today was meant to focus on the flood insurance program and some of the mitigation that's um, attendant to that. But I do want to point out, I, I know for a lot of people it's their first time here, we encourage you to come and be part of this on a regular basis because we do talk about a lot of the things that you're describing. And, and I'm just going to give you two really quick examples. Number one, um, we did work uh, in the Commonwealth to create a climate adaptation plan. Never existed before until the last couple of years. And the reason I know that is it was, I, I was one of the negotiators that worked with the Baker administration uh, as between the Senate and the House to get that plan in place and it gets revised periodically. That plan is meant to inform every other action by state government, where we spend money, how we change zoning laws, everything. So we are moving in that direction. It's slow, I'll admit that, but we are moving in that direction. As a result of that, we have put money in environmental bond bills in the tens of millions of dollars to try to fund um, some of the programs. We also have a grant program for strategies to meet uh, issues relative to climate change. And in fact, um, we have been working with Rockport to get some of those dollars. And um, we created a dam and seawall fund that's actually going to help with the seawall that you described. But putting that aside for the moment, the wheels are starting to turn. We are not at a very high speed yet, but I want you to, to know that. And the other really exciting thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, but I, I can't help but miss this opportunity to talk about this, because you opened a window, Alan, and okay, you, may you may regret it in a minute, but one of the things that we do at NECC and at MRBA is talk about how we can push that edge, how we can try to innovate. And one of the things that happened over the, was it two winters ago, Brenda? When we had an ice flow that actually deposited some sediment on the marsh, it created what I consider to be a once in a lifetime opportunity to study something called thin layer deposition, which is where we take the sediment from dredging, put it on the marsh, let the vegetation grow through it, and keep doing it to elevate, uh, my, my friends to the right, the grooves of the marsh will correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're trying to do is elevate the low marsh so that it becomes a better natural way to address climate change. The Commonwealth actually gave three communities or four money to study that to prove that it can work. 
So there's a lot going on. Now, we're, we're working to get more money for that. But the idea is that we're, we're always trying to look at ways to see what we can do. One of the bases of this group, one of its core functions, is to look at dredging. And so one of the things we also talk about is how not to lose the benefit of dredging if we can put those soils and those sediments in some place that's strategically important. So there's a lot uh, going on, and, and we are trying to push that envelope um, with this group. And the thing that's really important, and I just, I'll say it one more time, is that the reason we are successful, and if you look, the MRBA was sort of the parent of this group, so it's solved for your report and your group. The mayor's been heavily involved in that. Jeff Walker, a lot of people on the table. We have done things that never before got permitted or even were thought to be permittable. And we did that for one reason, and that is we all sit at the table, and it's really impressive when you look at the state agencies, the federal delegation, the state delegation, and so I would encourage you to continue to be a part of the discussion because we take what you've said very seriously. I just want you to know what you've seen today is one slice. You know, and, and I'll just give you one other example. Katie, uh, Kyle is working on a, a plan for the blue economy that we have also been involved in. So there are a lot of dimensions to this um, you know, as we move along. And um, I think it's important. And, and to highlight how important it is, I got a um, text uh, from the Gloucester Harbor Master a couple of minutes ago, and something that we have been fighting for for so <laughs> long, um, and with the help of Senator Markey and Senator Warren and Congressman Moult and Governor Baker, you know, to get the Anacorn River dredge, the latest estimate that that's going to start in 20 minutes, wow. and that would have never happen. <laughs> So please continue to be part of the discussion. I just, I, in fairness to our guests, I just, you know, they're here to cover a piece of this, yeah. and there are a lot of other things. Yeah, and I'd just like to make one note, too, is that, you know, we talk about flood insurance as a tool for resiliency here, or that's some of what we dug into, but as Joy will, will uh, attest to, that the ability to acquire properties and elevate them at harm's way across our communities over the last 50 years, or really 30 years, is only possible because of the insurance programs, because the Federal Mitigation Assistance Program is funded at a premium dollars paid by the flood insurance program. So that program has acquired and prevented $2 billion a year in future losses, as well as acquiring over 8,000 structures in the history of the flood program. So yes, insurance is one part of it, but because of the insurance program, we're able to acquire those structures that are in the, in the biggest harm's way. So. It's, it's an insurance, insurance is the most visible part of that program, but it does also, and I like to point that out because it's one of the lesser known parts of the flood program. So Joy, I just want to do a couple of things. One, I want to welcome Representative Brad Hill, um, who has joined us um, as part of our meeting, and ask if you could take a couple more questions. We're closing in on noon. Sure. We want to wrap by noon. Sure. So if you could take some more questions, that would be great. I think Jeff Walker has one. I want to really recognize Bruce and Brad first people on the political side to really recognize that the resiliency of our great mind is so important. And he's been at it a long time, and so has Brad. My question would be, and it's not meant to be pointed, I listened to what Ronnie was saying about erosion versus flooding versus loss. And my question is really simple. Is that definition relatively new? in the history of FEMA, and people that have held a policy for a very long time, would they be subject to a different standard? It's a great question. So there's a liberalization clause in the flood policy, which means that if something was proposed new with new coverage, and this is happening all the, this is happening within 10 years, not this part, but this additional coverage or the reduction of coverage, uh, the coverage is applied to the policy within 60 days of its renewal. So no, everybody currently, well, yeah, because there's been no new um, additions to the policy in the last four years. So technically, as of today, everybody has the same coverage, even if they've had their policy for 30 years. Um, then the definitions of what things are over time have changed, and they're all found within the National Flood Insurance Program. I think what my discussion earlier, the point of it was, when the adjuster gets there, and we saw this happen in Hurricane Sandy, their interpretation of what the cause of loss was is just that. It's their interpretation. 
That can be challenged through hiring outside engineers. That can be challenged by hiring a public adjuster. So the definitions, they do change occasionally. We haven't had a language change since 2015 and a policy change since two years ago. The, the one two years ago actually gave insurance more coverage. It used to be if there was an error in the flood policy, you had to go back five years to deduct the coverage. Now it's only two years at the most. Mostly, though, is the year that you're in. So that's only that's been the only major change in the last two or three years. So I'll go. I got a question here, and then I'll jump over there. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I, at the local level over the years, I've obviously dealt with uh, local amendments and bylaws and ordinances to comply with the requirements for the National Flood Insurance Program and so forth. Um, we work with public folks with GCR. Um, the question I would ask is, from the insurance perspective, um, we have those minimum standards that we go through on a periodic basis, um, but what sort of changes would you recommend we keep in mind or start to consider moving forward to address the insurance side of uh, impact on our constituents? That, that is a great question because floodplain management and insurance sometimes have some great, pretty big gaping holes in their co coordination together. The one I see the most often, there's several that I see, but the one I see the most often is the allowance of enclosures below elevated buildings in a B zone. So according to insurance, that enclosure cannot be any bigger than 299 square feet or else you're rated to the floor of that enclosure. The building code, as long as that enclosure has blowout walls, you can build that enclosure as big as you want. So the problem we see is how it's, especially on Cape Cod, we'll have enclosures of 1,500 square feet Absolutely nothing wrong from a floodplain management standard, as long as they they meet all the requirements for blowouts and all that type of stuff. For insurance purposes, we see those premium skyrockets. So if you have to put something in your bylaw, and Joy will know more about whether you actually can do that, um, you should limit your enclosure size in these zones to 299 square feet. Thank you. Yeah, and Joy, I don't know if you're able to. I'm not really sure. But you, you know you can't have anything that conflicts with the building code. Understood. Understood. On the other hand, you can have zoning areas where certain things are prohibited. Right, so right. We would consult the town. I would definitely try. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would like to make a comment uh, to the gentleman here who, your concern and the way you voiced that about managed retreat essentially is what you're talking about, is a national discussion, very robust national discussion. It has been for at least 10 years. It is ramping up rapidly. Um, with the onslaught of all of the things we're seeing. Um, and, you know, that policy or that solution is going to be found at a local level. It has to be. You're the one right there. You know, you're on the sea or you're on the river. Uh, and I, I know I got an article last night on the way out of the office. Uh, Virginia Beach um, just did something, I guess yesterday was the day they announced it. Um, so developers were developing the marshes, hello, Massachusetts, and um, Virginia Beach finally said, that's enough, enough is enough. And there was a huge development, I think it was 50 acres, I can't remember how many residential um, units were gonna be at the edge of the marsh, and Virginia Beach said, we're not letting you do it. They've had so many flood losses, the marshes are sinking, the waters are rising, and um, so it was a big fight locally because you can imagine the taxes, they were quote unquote giving up, but they did the math, and the flood damages were far more at the time. So that's a local discussion. It's a critical, critical discussion. Um, and I go to meetings every week where communities are having that discussion. And I don't think there's a one-fits-all answer. Certainly our state level um, you know, folks can, can support that kind of discussion, um, and policies can be bantered about until you know, folks finally think what will work for them. So a community has to really figure it out. What are you willing to give up for safety? Um, you know, and who's right and who's losing and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Can, can I just say, uh, with the Virginia example, out of the Supreme Court, that would be considered a taking under the Fifth Amendment. Well, the reason it wasn't considered a taking was because the town could prove the losses were great and that the losses to the community um, were significant. You know, emergency services, roads and bridges, anything that the community needed. Um, if you Google it, it just came out in the New York Times yesterday. There was an article from the and they did address that. So, um, you know, if a community, let me just say, 
in your local bylaws in order to meet the NFIP um, conditions, if you will, you have to state your purpose for your floodplain overlay district. Some people just have a one sentence that says, you know, we're looking to reduce flood loss protection, you know, flood losses. But a lot of communities have a list of, like, all those things I read earlier that were built into the cost benefit analysis or the mitigation itself. Um, so a community can put all kinds of things in as a purpose for that floodplain overlay district. Uh, and if those things are really valuable to that community, to the extent that they put them in the zoning bylaws, uh, then if you have some liability coming against you, you can point and say, we have said from this date that this was really important to us. So again, along the same lines, you can, um, the Conservation Law Foundation is always putting out new documents that talk about local liability for climate change. Um, there's all kinds of things. If you Google local liability, you know, liability for climate change, you'll find a ton of stuff. But it is a very ongoing discussion, um, and you know, we're, we, we have that discussion weekly, if not more often. Isn't it ultimately uh, it's going to be cheaper if we act proactively and look at some of these uh, repetitive losses and buy them out sooner rather than doing the mitigation so that essentially we're paying twice as much or three times as much when we have to buy out that same property after we've done all these things. So we're paying two or three times. Well, if you take too long, the property won't be worth anything anyway, if it's still there. You know, so there's that balance too. The uh, FFA- But, but then, you've, then, you've, <laughs> then you've wasted even more money. <laughs> The uh, FMA grant program through the HMA programs that I mentioned earlier gives 100% reimbursement for severe repetitive losses. So when a community has interest in moving forward, they should be looking at prioritizing those exact structures that you talked about to get rid of those the first, the very first. But, and but the owner has to be a willing seller. That's, yeah, so you can't just come into it. Very good point, thank you. I, I will say this, it, on Plum Island, a number of years ago, we lost a number of and it was a very valiant attempt by the emergency management coordinator and the town officials, particularly in the town of Newbury, to try to buy some of those parcels, and not one of them qualified. So that's why we're going to continue to work with the federal delegation around what those definitions are, because we did have some willing sellers, and they weren't able to take advantage of the program. And interestingly enough, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but on almost every one of those lots, there is now another house. And those are lots where houses have fallen into the ocean. Yeah. So one of the other things we're trying to do, and the Senate has passed this a couple of times and we work with our colleagues in the House, is to try to create a state level program to do that kind of purchase where the federal program might not be able to pick it up. But it sure would be nice if we could harmonize with the federal government to maximize the utility of those programs. Yeah, uh, this, your point is exactly right. Uh, at state level, you can control what you are and are not willing to do. Um, the FEMA grants that Joe keeps referring to, while they're lovely that those exist, they are very difficult to get. They are take forever to actually implement. I mean, you can um, apply for one, you're, you know, so the homeowner can't apply. They have to apply through the town. The town has to apply to the state. The state applies to FEMA. It takes forever. It could, the contracting can take a couple of years. You may not even start um, the mitigation activity for three years after the grant. Meanwhile, if the person's out of their home because of damage, you know, they're living somewhere, you know, so it's, it can be a nightmare. So a state program would be wonderful. We're working on it. Great, yes. I'm the president of the tax savers on Palm Island. And if I had a group of people in front of me and I'm trying to explain what your insurance covers, when people get their insurance policy, they don't read it like you think. Absolutely. And their agent says it covers such and such, which if it doesn't, that's errors of omission on the agents. Absolutely. Right? But it's very hard to tell people that you may, may not be covered by certain things. We have to have real definition of what it's going to be to explain people. I explained to a whole group of people and did a whole thing around the island that if you got insurance, the rate would stay the same afterwards, it's grandfathered. And that wasn't true, yeah. okay? So I can't explain to my Pitter people 
on Plum Island, anything you said, because it's very vague. Yeah, well, let me give you an example of exactly what you're talking about. Um, the federal and flood insurance policy, and again, totally understand people don't read them. My, my advice is to read them, but I understand people don't. So don't take that as something that I'm assuming, because I know that people don't. But as an example, the policy says that cleanup costs are covered, which they are. But that's, a, that's not true. Well, that's also not true because they're covered, but to a certain extent, and FEMA had to issue a six-page bulletin explaining what coverages are, which coverage, which cleanups are, which cleanups not. It's fan per square foot. So the point I'm making is, you're right, it becomes very difficult, and I think the thing Joy and I see all the time in general, again, this isn't to point out one or the other, is that those involved in the sale of insurance are not all experts in flood insurance. And so when you have the explanations of some of these things in some communities, there are, I mean, I cannot tell you how many of these I've gone to over 10 years where I'm sitting in the audience going, okay, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. So again, that's why Joy and I are here today to, re to make sure that we can reach out to you to help explain this to your constituents or come and help explain it to them. But, but you haven't helped no. Yeah, it's um, it's difficult. You can go online and Google flood NFIP flood insurance manual. Make sure you're getting the current one. It changes twice a year, or can change twice a year. Um, and that, and you can read that from cover to cover. I don't know how many pages it is, a few hundred. Um, and you can see all the details in there for an NFIP policy. But still, you have an adjuster. So when you have a, no, a, a claim, that, an adjuster interprets. But what I'm saying is. It's it's not straightforward. Right. It's it's very complicated, and mm -hmm. the, when the, the person has the loss, he just goes to all his government officials and says, "I bought the insurance. Yeah. We went through this on Plum Island." Yeah. That's where a public adjuster would come in to help you, and that's an adjuster. That I know. I know all about those things. I used to own an insurance company, a company, not an agency. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know how you reinsure, I know how we, we sat down in meetings and, and uh, found out ways to sneak little things in so it would save us money, okay? So we wouldn't have to pay out. I know all about like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what I'm saying, and Joy and I are saying, is that anyway, I, I understand it's, it's difficult to understand. I mean, I think that's why Joy and I started this, getting into this in the first place, is to help try as best as we can to help you understand. But, if there's any way Joy and I can be of further assistance beyond the meeting today, to either come and speak to your neighborhood association, supply you with documents or handouts that help you guide you in the right direction, that's why we're here as a resource for you. Yeah, and I am totally not an insurance person, so I would refer you to insurance people mm -hmm. like today. But you would come to, to, to the hall, either one or both of you, to have a, a further discussion if that's what Absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, but that's what I'm getting to, but it's still going to be confusing to me. I, I understand that we're not going to get around there. Yeah. And you still want to get the road insurance policy. Yeah. I mean, we I understand exactly <coughs> what they do. Yeah. I never saw the people. All right, we really we get time for maybe one more question. And, and then these guys will be around. I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to. Uh, you mentioned the person, a new person being brought on that can answer insurance questions or help out of these guy folks. Um, since we get those questions on a regular basis, I imagine some folks here might be interested as well. Is there any way that um, in contact information that the specific person could be sent out through the group? So Absolutely. Actually, if you go to our, and, and I'll, I'll send this out, if you go to our site and go to the services page, there's a form you fill out right there that goes directly to our service. Okay. Yeah, you just fill your question out. And, and, and if you have questions about a, an NFIP policy, let me give you the name of the fellow that does that. So in every FEMA region, there are 10 FEMA regions. In every region, they have an expert. He doesn't sell insurance, but he knows the NFIP like the back of his hand for insurance policies, okay? So this fellow for our region, his name is Tom Young, and anyone can call him. His number is 603, he works out in New Hampshire for all of New England, 625-5125. Um, and if you need his um, email address, he's coming at him. Thank you. So there's, there's a bunch of resources available. Thank you.